My name is John Osborne, and I'm really excited to talk at the uh, Ascend Data Pipeline Automation Summit here in 2023. Let's get started. The talk today is data mesh automation and how Ascend can help you implement a data mesh, and more importantly, what is a general data mesh? And can your implementation actually provide a data mesh experience for your users? My name is John Osborne. I'm the field CTO here at Ascend. I have the excellent job of evangelizing data automation and pipelines and things, but also help the product team work through features and, and activities for improving Ascend as a product. What, I wanna, what I'd like to do today is review what a data mesh is strategically at a high level. I don't think we'll get into enough detail in the half an hour we have to, to get like super detailed, but we'll cover the high levels. Then I'd like to talk through what outcomes you could expect by implementing a data mesh and how a data mesh can help you in your organization to provide better data services for your consumers. And then Assuming that you'd like to pursue those outcomes, how do you get started building data mesh? What, what can I do first and tactically, what, what options are available to me to get going? So let's start with uh, reviewing data mesh strategies at a high level. If you've Googled data mesh or you're researching it or you've read a bunch of paper, mesh can definitely feel complex hard to implement, and uh, there's a lot of things to consider. So uh, that being said, let's uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about how to simplify the journey and maybe find a way to, to think about Mesh and to operate Mesh in a way that actually provides value to you more quickly. If we look at the history of maybe even the term data Mesh, I think we can attribute almost all of that to a woman by the name of Zamak Dengani. She, in partnership with ThoughtWorks and Martin Fowler, developed some really excellent um, documentation on describing meshes, how they work, why, why they exist, and those types of things. I won't go into extreme detail with mesh today for lack of time, but what I do want to do is cover what, it, what a mesh is at the very highest level. So at the highest level, uh, the brilliance of the work that ThoughtWorks and Samak did was put together two notions that have been working quite well, both outside of software technologies, but also inside of like front-end software technologies. And a lot of that work centers around having a product mindset and then plugging that together with these business data domains. And so let's talk about those for a second. A product mindset means that we're taking customer feedback and improving our product and iterating on products using customer feedback and, and using uh, metrics to, to shape our ideas about what a product is. Uh, at, the, at its simplest level, if a customer wants features updated and those, and those updates affect all customers and it makes the product better, then we should appropriately react and improve the product and iterate on it. And there's many, many examples of how the product mindset has helped not only .com, like data companies, but also like products in your kitchen or your bathroom go through very much iterative processes following a product mindset. So product mindset is one key feature. The second key feature is breaking down our data domains or pieces of our products <clears throat> into these concepts called bounded context. And what does it, what is a bounded, bounded context? A bounded context is a way to think about uh, how your business aligns with your data assets. So we'll talk specifically about data today. There's other ways to think about the contextual bounds in your business, but let's talk about how it relates to data. And what this means is if I have a customer record, for example, I may have heard the term a single source of truth for customer. And so if we build a single source of truth, what we're doing is we're excluding other contexts from that customer. And so we're bounding that we're bounding, we're drawing a boundary around that customer and saying, this is my customer data. 
here's how the customer is defined and here's how I relate a customer to, for example, an order or a shipment, which might be other contexts in your business. The point of the these seams that we're building between these concepts in the, in the business is to eliminate distractions and make the context unpolluted by other activities so that if I need customer information, I have a, a context to go and pull customer information and then I can combine that data with potentially an order history information to create maybe a order preference data product that I would use in an app, for example. If we combine this product mindset and business domain knowledge into a higher concept, we would call this a data mesh. And this is what Zamak and has very nicely articulated in so many documents. And there's all kinds of things to research about it. And it's a very deep topic. It's very mature thought process, but at its highest level, it's product mindset plus business domain. If we go to implement data mesh, it starts to look like a distributed set of technologies. So on our, uh, these circles here would represent various business domains or bounded contexts. Say one is a uh, HR system with employee data. Another one might be a customer. So another one might be a, a shipment or inventory system. Regardless, we're gonna, we draw boundaries and seams or, or we draw boundaries around them, and then we seam them together to create a business deliverable called a data product. So one reason why mesh is important to us is, and the reason that we're researching it is, is that we're going slow in our current architectures. One way to think about that is architectures that are not meshes tend to be monolithic architectures in that I have my data, my business data is overlaid with each other. It's very tightly coupled. And most often it's even coupled in a single system. So I have one massive database with a very complicated, maybe a dimensional model in there or lots of transactional data overlapping customer information with order information, with web click history or all kinds of other information. At the end of the day, I have a giant monolithic data architecture and some data lakes end up looking like monolithic architectures in that all the data is in one place. It's not contextualized into these, into, into separate regions potentially. And then I'm trying to look at all of this data at once and try and make sense of it. So why do these architectures slow us down? The two main reasons, and there are many more reasons, but the two main reasons that I like to think about are is one, I end up in a monolithic architecture having to rely on a very small number of data experts who have the cognitive capacity to understand what's going on in the monolithic architecture. And uh, moreover, they probably have hyper specialized skill sets. So if I'm using tools to combine this data in very specialized ways because it's all put together in a ball of spaghetti or mud, I need very special skills. So I end up generating bottlenecks because I can only hire so many people that have the ability to manage this level of detail with the amount of skill that's required. The other reason we slow down is we tend to build everything for everyone data models. That being the giant, a data model, for example, that has eight or 900 tables in it. And yes, it includes all the information I need and I can write any query I need to pull data out of it. But over 800 or 900 tables, it's not realistic to expect normal humans to come and write queries against that type of activity. It becomes too complex. The level of complexity exceeds my ability to use the product. So I, I tend to not use the product and I rely again back on these hyper-specialized individuals who understand the nuances of how to query the data you're looking for. So personas like analysts and data scientists, for example, end up having to file tickets so that the ticket can get routed to the specialist to figure out what the query is so that then we can deliver the data to them. Uh, there's many, many stories out there in the world about how this works, but monolithic architectures 
clearly cause issues, especially at scale. So why does a mesh work for us? If So if monolithic is slow, we want to improve our experience, how is mesh going to help? The first way it helps is it allows me to align my data domains with the people who understand all of the data and understand how to build the domain. In other words, have the pipeline ownership distributed. For example, I may have one or two individuals in my organization, if I'm in healthcare, for example, that understand how claim coding works, for example, for diagnoses. I may have an expert in that, but that person may not be an expert in facility or patient management data. So by building a data mesh, I can more align my data with the experts that I have available to me, and I can start to solve problems for those particular types of data in very small bounded ways so that I'm not distracted by issues that don't concern my domain. And then I'm not also bound in a change management way across domains when the change is specific for a particular domain. Another way that Mesh helps us scale up is that I can use the data product mindset to more rapidly iterate on these contexts. So having the experts centralized on a particular context and having that context be pulled away from all of the other complexities of my data environment allows the iteration to go more quickly. So it means that I can build data products in my domain that are more approachable and more easy to consume from, from external users. External users being either within my organization or actually customer users potentially too. And so that drives the third point, which is I actually can have some approachable self-service. As much as we would like to have people do self-service, approaching a monolithic architecture it tends to not work out very well because the queries are too complicated, it's too hard, or I have to build way too many data marts, which end up looking like data domains, and I can't manage it. In the mesh world, I have a much better chance of building data products that are simple, easy to join together, and provide nearly all, or frankly, all of the value that I would have had in a different architecture. So if we look at what a mesh is, a mesh will have these typical attributes. So the first is in a mesh, I need to be able to find my context information and I need to be able to share it. So as a producer of customer information, if I'm producing that information and nobody can receive that data or subscribe to my data, then I'm not helping myself. I'm not enabling that self-service. So discoverability, where is my data and shareability, how do I use it? that needs to be available. The second point, the data needs to be approachable and then usable. So usability speaks to, our, to data quality. So the data should be high quality. I should be able to trust my data and I should be able to approach the data model with normal uh, understanding of how the data works. For example, if the company has a ubiquitous language that calls a customer you know, a customer, then we should have the data model reflect the business language and business terms so that people not in the technical community understand what the data is. The third point is very important to all data people. If I don't trust data, I'm not going to use the data. This data needs to be trustworthy and we can drive trustworthiness through quality controls, which we can, we'll talk about in a minute. Of course, the last two points are important. One is data always needs to be secure. We, I'm not going to talk about that in detail. We just need to make sure the data is secure and there's many ways to do that. But the data also needs to be standardized. And what I mean by that is more than just naming conventions and sort of the obvious standardizations. It also means when I consume the data, I need to be able to consume and subscribe to these domains in a way that doesn't change from one domain to another. Otherwise, the usage pattern of the data consumer becomes too complex. If I have to connect to a REST service for one domain, but I need to do a JDBC connection for another domain, and yet again, some other type of connection for a third domain, it becomes very difficult for me as a data consumer to actually consume the data. When I build all four of these, 
I end up with something that looks like a data mesh. Looking at this from a graphical view, just to double click on it, this looks like a customer domain, for example, having first name, last name, where you live, that kind of information. And maybe a shipment domain, which says, this is the shipping information that the carrier I'm going to use, the first class, second, the shipment type, and all kinds of other information. And maybe I have a data product that I want to build for an app that ends up looking like a customer shipment profile. So clearly I need to know some customer information about it, but then I clearly need to know the shipment history. And then from there I can build a customer profile for this fulfillment app. I could of course choose a monolithic architecture, combine all of these things together and try and build that. And then repeating that over and over and over again, of course ends up in this bottleneck state. In the mesh world, I can build this as a combination of only two domains and really simplify the access to this information. So if that's the high level data mesh strategy, there's tons more information you can learn online. I'm not in this short time period of time going to get into all the details, of course, but it, it, at a high level, if you're willing to accept strategically where we're headed, now we can talk about what we're going to do with this strategy. What outcomes are we seeking? Obviously, the first outcome and the most important outcome of any change in technology paradigms or business paradigms, particularly around data management, is, is it working for me? So I want to know, like, is my business improving? Am I actually solving the problem that I have? Or am I squeezing the balloon? That is, am I just moving the problem from one place to another? I personally encourage people and organizations to think about these changes in terms of return on investment. So in that way, we can at least strive for some actual metrics for improvement. We can uh, fall back to some proxy metrics, but at least we're thinking about the, the real outcomes for these, these types of changes. Uh, following this pattern tends to make CFOs, CEOs, C-suite people a lot more comfortable that the change in the investment we're going to make is going to pay off, and at least it holds us accountable. So let's talk about maybe three of these things. There are many, many ways to measure improvement. These are three ideas, and there's more out there. The first is, if I'm exploring a mesh, one of the reasons I may be exploring it is I feel like my org is going too slow. I'm not producing enough data outcomes. My backlogs are too long for engineering, and I want to go faster. So one way to measure the outcome of data mesh is through data product velocity improvement. So can I produce things more quickly? And that could be a measure of how fast I'm actually producing things. It could be a measure of how long my backlog is. If my backlog is getting shorter, theoretically I'm going faster maybe. Regardless, I want to measure improvement. A second thing to measure might be how many times am I reusing a domain? So if I build a customer domain and it never gets used, that's obviously a failure in, in either advertising the domain exists or the adoption isn't working or I built the wrong domain, frankly. If my domain is used many, many, many times all over the place with all the businesses, that's an indicator that the mesh strategy is working, the data is approachable, consumers are consuming it, and the data is useful. The first two are very technical implementation metrics. I do like to include human-centric metrics too. These tend to be a little harder to measure, but I believe that if, if a mesh is implemented correctly, or not correctly, it's really not wrong, right or wrong way, but if it's working for you, the number of people in meetings should get down. There shouldn't be giant change control meetings where you're deciding on making changes that affect everything. The changes should be scoped smaller. Producing products should include only a few people from a few domains. And the key people in my organization who I rely on on a daily basis shouldn't be showing up in every single meeting. They should be working on the things that we're asking them to work on and not working on change management type activities as much as they would have in a monolithic architecture. So here's three ways to think about the ROI. Again, I'm a, a big proponent of, of seeking improvement in the human life cycle in technology and, and in particular in data. 
<clears throat> if a monolithic architecture feels like a data engineer does a whole bunch of work on relatively slow cycles and throws the work over the wall to an analyst, this is how monolithic architectures tend to feel. Analysts write tickets or data scientists write tickets for queries. The query goes into a backlog. Eventually they get their data and the data may be right or wrong. But at the end of the day, they don't really do much when they receive the data other than complete the, the work that they were going to do from the query. In a mesh architecture, this should feel different. <clears throat> so if the architecture is working and nothing changes, then it's probably not actually working. We just did something we called a mesh and it didn't really work. But if, I, if I'm implementing a mesh architecture and I'm changing the way the behaviors are working in my org, now, then it's probably having a positive effect. In a data mesh architecture, domain engineers, first of all, which is different than a data engineer, and we'll talk about it in a minute, in general will iterate more quickly and they will do less work. Part of the reason they're going to do less work is because analysts and potentially other cohorts like data scientists or frankly even business users can pick the raw data up sooner and take it to the end. So a real simple example is if in a monolithic architecture, I have to specify how a customer name is formatted, first name, space, last name, last name, comma, first name, and passing that over to an engineer. In a mesh architecture, that would not be the case. I would produce simply a customer record, the record's understandable, and my analysts and data scientists can process that record however they see fit. At the end of the day, I have more fingers on keyboards and I'm doing less work up front so the organization can move more quickly to produce more data products. So this is a graphical way to think about how a mesh ends up helping in the, when it's working for you. Back to data versus domain engineers, just a real quick point. Data engineers in general, they cover lots of scope across the entire organization. They understand everything about everything in general. They're also a shared resource, so they have competing priorities. You know, one team wants one answer now, and another team wants another answer, so these, com these priorities compete, and you can think about the rest. As we transition into a mesh, we can start to think about domain engineers. So these end up being specialists, but only within the domain. So if I'm a customer data specialist, I may not really know how the shipment information works or anything like that, but I'm an expert in my customer data, and my customer data is small enough that like normal humans can can achieve a lot of positive outcome with, with this size data. It also means that I'm not competing with priorities. So I'm doing my work on customer and I don't have to really consider or be, even be aware of other information that's changing in the organization. So that helps me with context switching and kind of all the bad bad things that happen when you become a shared resource. An interesting question, which I'm not going to cover here, but an interesting question is if we transition from data engineering, which is typically central IT, to domain engineering, which feels more like business-centric engineering, what is the vision for corporate IT? There's quite a few things to talk about there. Maybe in the Q&A, we can talk through some of that. So if we're comfortable with what a mesh is and we're comfortable with the outcomes that we're seeking, this velocity or or, or higher quality data or whatever we're trying to achieve with a mesh. How are we actually going to get started is the next question. So let's, so let's look at that for a few minutes. Um, the first point I would like to make is whether you choose to do a mesh or not a mesh, using data as a product mindset in your world will help drive goodness out of your organization regardless. This is because receiving customer feedback and turning around updates really does help consumption in data and make it easier for people to use data in useful ways. So regardless of your architecture, if it's monolithic or mesh or fabric or something else, having a data as a product mindset where we're focused on customer feedback to drive more usage and better usage of our data is a valuable tool. So I encourage that regardless of whether you choose. If you're going to do a mesh though, there are a few things to consider that you have to read between the lines to understand. So let's talk about some of those things too. I like to go to the core assumptions for these strategies. 
So when we go to implement them, the assumptions need to be true. Otherwise, the strategy won't work for you. So let's talk through some of the assumptions that you may or may not understand about Mesh. If you read some of the papers online, they talk about all the things that you should do and all the things that you can do. Underneath that, there's a set of assumptions. The first assumption is that the technology and the domain expertise actually exists to build your data domains. For example, on the technology side, if your customer data is wholly encapsulated in Excel spreadsheets and you don't have a, a queryable database asset for that domain, that problem will need to be solved before you can actually construct the domain. And that's a simple example. And there's many, many other examples, but the technology must exist. It's also true that when I perform that conversion from non-queryable to queryable data, someone uh, who understands this data in detail needs to be available for that work. If nobody understands it, that's obviously a problem. But if the expert is on a, a different priority at the moment and they are not available, then it's not realistic maybe to take on the data mesh at this given time. Not that this is a great time to distract your super valuable folks, but these people need to be available to you. It's also true that I need data pipelines and I need data sharing capability. So building a domain is, is one activity. Pipelining it is another activity so that I can keep the data up to date. And the third activity is actually sharing that data. So if I can't do the pipelining and the sharing, what I'm building is a one-off copy of my domain. And now I'm left with stale data. As soon as I build it, it's out of date. So I need to keep it up to date. And then subscribers need to be able to come and use the data. So sharing is an assumption that the data mesh strategy makes. It's also true that a working governance strategy needs to be deployed in your organization. And the key word in this sentence is working. Governance strategies that are, you know, a bunch of rules that nobody's paying attention to or are so burdensome that it takes longer to do the governance than to make the changes. I would argue those are not working strategies. So this working strategy needs to work and you need to have a governance strategy for sure. The other uh, assumption, the last one that's, that's important, there's a couple others, but for the sake of time, let's talk that every domain needs maturity in this organization for sure. Really quickly, let's recall that a mesh needs to be discoverable, shareable, approachable, trustworthy, secure, and standard. We covered that earlier, but let's understand what decisions need to be made. So what is the plan to bridge domain and technical gaps. So if you have those gaps, what's, what's the plan to do that? Are we gonna hire people? Are we going to use a shared resource for that? How are we gonna do that? It's also true that we have to decide, does each domain do their own thing or are we gonna have a standard platform? And if every domain does their own thing, what's the contractual obligation to become a standardized uh, interface? Or are we gonna rely on a platform to roll their own? or a platform to provide that standardization, excuse me. And then of course we need to consider, are we gonna build or buy this or some combination? It's not a de facto standard anymore that you need to build everything. There are tools available, including Ascend that can help with this mesh implementation. So we should consider which ones we build and buy, or are we just gonna buy a platform that does helps us achieve all of them, for example. And whether you're building or buying, data pipelines need to exist in your solution and data sharing needs to exist. So if you are using the build strategy, this notion that building sharing has to also be built needs to be top of mind for you. Building your data domains is only the first part of the journey. Actually sharing the data is potentially even the hardest part of the journey. So definitely consider that. So that covering data mesh, what I'd like to do is show you very quickly in about a minute, how Ascend helps with mesh and how the sharing and pipelining can work. So we're gonna switch tabs here to a demo. 
This is a very simple data flow of taxicab data ending in a data share over here. I'm going to combine that with weather. I'm going to with weather data, but I'm going to show you the weather domain first. So this is the weather domain. So this is just weather data. Notice there's no taxi information or anything like that. And then with Ascend, because we have sharing built in, I can build a data product from the taxi and domain weather data so that I can subscribe to both of these domains. And then I can combine them and create some data products here, like a report about bad weather taxi rides or the number of the average tip amounts for good weather rides, those kind of things. I hope you've appreciated and thank you for joining the data mesh demo here with Ascend. Please feel free to reach out and stay online for the Q&A follow-up after. Thank you very much. Great, awesome walkthrough of a data mesh, John. Let's get right into some Q&A questions. Um, yeah, that's great. First up, so how does Ascend help me build a data mesh more quickly than if I did it with my own engineers? Oh, so I love that question because that pokes right at <clears throat> what Ascend is really helping with. But, you know, building data flows that are useful is a complicated affair and if you're doing it yourself you're taking on um, all kinds of responsibilities including when to run things so scheduling like how to run them so which environment if i have a mix of python and sql and other languages maybe you know i kind of have to consider all of that and then the sharing activity around, oh, if I'm building a domain, then my engineers have to share that. So I have to come up with a strategy and it's not that you can't do that on your own, but if you're building, you generally run out of time and money or money or both. And the sharing part tends to not get full love. So I don't really have maybe a data catalog that I'd like to have. And so in Ascend, all that stuff all just comes out of the box because Ascend focuses on um, helping you put your logic into the tool. And then expressing that logic in terms of domains means that you can, you can build data products really quickly in Ascend because we take all of the toil and unnecessary, in our view, tasks away from developers so they can, they can just focus on, on the logical pieces of it. So... Yeah, that's how that's 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 how Ascend really helps people build meshes. So, and I love the fact that Ascend actually is an excellent mesh solution. When I was a a CDO in my previous life, I wish I would have bought Ascend because like doing data meshes on your own is really hard or impossible, and you almost never really succeed. Like you, you're everybody's successful, but on the spectrum of like perfect to like fail, you're always in the middle somewhere. So. Along those along those lines of if say we we do you know have the team move into ascend, how can we have the team embrace the data as a product mindset? Mm, yeah, I love that question. I think I think that one uh, embracing data as a product really comes down to one of the side effects of building mesh. And if you build the mesh way, your domain, your engineers working in domains will become experts in that domain. But that also means that they build relationships with their business partners. So having a close relationship with a business partner who know who's an expert in that part of your business and having yourself be the engineer or one of the engineers who understand that domain in such detail that you speak the same language, that means that it's very easy then to figure out how the feedback cycle works. And when you, you can empathize with your business partners and you know, really kind of personal ways, like you, you, you're friends and you can understand each other. And so when your business partners have, have issues, you can really sort of address them in real ways. And, and that's a way to drive product mindset without being super formal about product management. But then the product management part just becomes easier because we're more focused in areas that matter to the, to our business partners. And so so building that, it, it, it comes naturally. If you're building a mesh properly, it should come naturally for sure. So it's fun to do, by the way. So 
<laughs> I'm a fan of like happy developers. <laughs> yeah, love uh, love having uh, our lives made a little easier here. So, one question that we also had: I might have a ton of I have a ton of data domains in my business. Do I need to complete all of them in order to have a data mesh? Oh yeah. So so here's the thing. About, one of the things about mesh, like nobody ever does a perfect data mesh. There's no such thing. And even one domain that you build and share and gets consumed is a win, right? So if, in the spectrum of work that you could possibly do with Mesh, there's no wrong answer and there's no like bar to cross where I have to produce a whole bunch of things before I can actually use it. Yeah, that's not actually that's not actually true. You can start with a single domain that's super simple and get really good at that and then learn and iterate on that. And then once your business is comfortable with that and you feel kind of like you can see the road forward for the other domains, you can actually make really good progress. And even to the point where you know, you may understand or scope a domain but never actually build it because maybe the data doesn't change very often. So I don't like, or maybe it's not very, it's not widely used data, so I can sort of leave it where it lies. So there's definitely a spectrum of completeness, let's call it. Um, I think Ascend makes it easier, frankly, to get further down the road much more quickly. But that being said, there's no reason to wait and over-engineer the whole thing. I do not need to design every single domain <laughs> before I start. You know, when you create, create your second domain, you probably need to understand how the domains relate. Like, is a customer ID a customer ID I can use, for example, to like hook to a shipment, for example. So as you build more and more domains, you'll get better at defining how the domains relate to each other so that I can combine them. But just because you haven't built every single domain doesn't mean that you're not driving value for your company, for sure. So. I love that question. Engineer, where some of us or most of us are engineers, right? So we, we want it to be perfect, but the reality is it doesn't need to be. There's no, there's no, there's no hundred percent answer to any of it. It's more about like, uh, are we are we driving the business forward and are we moving cycles in the right direction and doing useful work? So I think that's really yeah. important. Progress over perfection. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> I actually got that question in our world tour just yesterday in Seattle. Somebody asked. Oh, wow. Question. Cool. So, yeah. Awesome. So uh, I, I enjoy talking through that because I think there, uh, that can be a a reason to not do a mesh is because I can't do all the domains. And, and right. you know, that's, uh, you know, that's not, that's, that's not true. There's, there's really no reason to not start except if maybe your finance is in Microsoft Excel, maybe we should solve that problem first. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if I have a little bit of technology available, you know, we can, we can improve it by building a mesh and then, and then even go even further by adding a send as a automation yeah. tool. So. Yeah, Which we do have a connector true. for Google sheets. So if you can get your Excel into Google sheets. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. absolutely true, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that wraps up our first product session of the conference. Thank you so much, John.